Well, let me welcome you here to Big Valley Grace, especially if this is your uh, first time with us. Welcome, welcome to all of you that are watching online. I'm, I'm glad you're with us. Uh, take your Bibles, okay, and turn to the book of Ephesians. If you don't own a Bible, all you have to do when we're done is go into the altar room and we'll give you a Bible. We want to make sure that you have the Word of God in your hands. You can take it home. You can read it. You can highlight it. You can make notes in it, make comments in it, or whatever. So if you don't own a copy of the, the Scriptures, it's a, really a, a privilege of ours to, to, to give you one. We're going to begin a, a brand new series here today where we're going to go through the book of Ephesians uh, together. We've entitled it uh, A Brand New We. And we thought a lot about this title. Um, if if uh, what's happened already last night and last hour is any indication of what God's going to do through this series, um, we are going to be a brand new we. You see, the Lord's going to use this in your own individual life, I guarantee it. And as the Lord uses this letter in your own individual life, guess what happens? It changes us. It changes we together, the, what, what God is doing here. And last night I got a lot of emails, crazy, what the Lord was doing last night here, just, just really cool stuff. And last hour, and I have no doubt God's going to do some, some great things in your life this hour. We also are making available to you these little, um, oh, they're, they're little commentaries that you're going to write on the book of Ephesians. Inside, uh, actually, you will find the entire book of Ephesians, and then there are some places where you can take some notes and things, and we want you on your lunch hours or maybe in the morning when you're having coffee or whatever, just to take this and read through it and, and maybe put some notes out here. You could take the notes that are inside your program and you could put them in here. And by the time we're done, you would have your own commentary, if you will, on the book of Ephesians. And so make sure you take advantage of the three bucks. We're going to ask you to invest three dollars in your spiritual life. So make sure you take advantage of it. Uh, a lot of things are going to happen. I guarantee you, you're going to enjoy this study. And the reason why you're going to enjoy it is because as we go through it, you're going to find out exactly who you are in Christ. Some of you don't know that. Some of you aren't familiar with that. And I guarantee as we go through it, you're just going to, you're going to dig it. You're going to enjoy learning about that. Number two, you're going to feel more loved by God. And the reason why you're going to feel more loved by God as we go through this series is because you're going to understand at a deeper level just who you are in Christ. And number three, you're, you're going to feel more capable of doing the things that God wants you to do. And the reason why you're going to feel more capable to do the things that God wants you to do is because you're going to have a greater understanding of who you are in Christ. So let me tell you a little bit about Ephesians. Let me give you a little, little background on it. Um, the book of Ephesians was, was written by Paul, and when he wrote it, he was, in, he was in prison, and he wrote it to a church that was in a city called Ephesus, hence the name e Ephesians, and he wrote that letter while he was in prison about 25 to 30 years after Jesus dies on a cross, after he was put in a tomb and is raised again. So the book of Ephesians was actually written somewhere around 60 A.D. The church was probably started by this great married couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. They were actually with Paul when he went on his second missionary journey, and Paul left them there to be the overseers, if you will, of this church. And it struggled for a while, especially when it first got going, like most young churches do. It, it took some time for it to gain some, some traction. In fact, Paul actually goes back to Ephesus, and he actually pastored the church for three years. And after leading the church for three years, he now leaves the church with a new pastor, a new young pastor whose name was Timothy. So Timothy becomes the, the pastor of this church, and then about uh, 30 years after Paul writes this letter, so if he writes Ephesians in about 60 A.D., in 90 A.D., a guy by the name of John, 
And he was in prison on an island called Patmos, writes the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter two, Jesus writes uh, a letter to seven different churches that were in and around Asia Minor at the time. And one of the churches that Jesus writes a letter to in, he, in Revelation chapter two is the church at Ephesus. So the church at Ephesus has a rich history, an incredible history, and I guarantee you, as I said a minute ago, God, God's gonna do some really, really great and deep things in all of our lives. It's gonna change us. It's gonna change we as a church. Now, what I need you to do is put your phones down and all that kind of stuff. I need you to focus, okay? Put your thinking caps on. And we're gonna give you an overview of the entire book of Ephesians. And we got this video we want you to watch. It's really great, so check out the jumbotrons. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story, personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in, and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish-style poem where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purposed to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1, verse 10, that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth, under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about, but personally experience the power of the gospel, that they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter two, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter one, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. 
before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears, and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one, and one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says, unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple. And the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity, in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflicts. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's Spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus' body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful.
It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. That's pretty good, wasn't it? <clears throat> yeah. So we have a, a lot of work to do over these next, uh, I don't know, 10 or so weeks as the teaching team unpacks the, the story here, this letter of Ephesians, and the same thing's happening on our series campus right now. And so take uh, your Bibles and look at Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna look at the first five verses, all right? The word of God says this. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus, these are the Christians that are in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and give you peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and God chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Okay, and we'll stop right there. These five verses are just jam-packed. We're full of what we might call theological truths, biblical truths. There's way more just in those five verses than I got time to cover even today. But the truth is important for us to know. The biblical truth, biblical theology, doctrine is important for us to know. It was Jesus who said this in John chapter eight. He said, it's the truth that will set you free. And the truth that Jesus is talking about here isn't the truth that two plus two equals four. That's truth but that won't set you free. Four plus four equals eight. That's truth, but that won't set you free. We won, you know, the Second World War. That's truth, but that won't set you free. Jesus is talking about the truth that you find between these two leather-bound covers. The truth that's found in the Word of God. When you know the truth, when you understand the truth, when you live the truth of God's Word out, that is what sets you free. So here we are, we've taken this letter, this letter that God had Paul write to this church in Ephesus, and we're gonna look at it because it's full of truth. And it's the truth that we're gonna learn in this letter that's gonna set you free. It's gonna change your life, which then in turn is gonna change, I think, us as a church. You see, a new house won't set you free. A new car won't set you free. A new boyfriend or girlfriend won't set you free. A new spouse won't set you free. A new or a better job won't set you free. Winning the lottery won't set you free. Those things will change you. They'll change your life. If you leave here today and you know, you hit the lottery and you win 10 million bucks or 100 million bucks, that will change you but it won't set you free. B buying a brand new home, that'll change you, but it won't set you free. The only thing that'll set you free, truly free, is truth. And that's with a capital T, God's truth. So here's what I wanna do in the, in the short amount of time that I have left. We're gonna, we're gonna look at four truths. Four huge, weighty, biblical truths. And keep in mind, Jesus said it's the truth, these four things, that will set you free. It will change your, your, your life. And we're going to look at four things, basically, that the Father has done for us. And the first one is, he's blessed you. He's blessed you. Look at verse 3. 
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in, he in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. And there are two things I want you to notice in that verse. Number one, these are spiritual blessings. These aren't physical blessings. Your flesh is super interested in, in, in physical blessings. New cars, new houses, new chains, new clothes, new stuff, da, da, da. That's what your flesh is super interested in. These are, are spiritual blessings. And the second thing I want you to notice is the word has. Th these are, these are uh, uh, blessings that you have right now. Now, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've given your life to Christ, if you've become a Christian, if you've surrendered your life to him, if you've dedicated your life to him, whatever, however you want to word it, these blessings are yours right now. You have them right now. But here's the deal. Too many of you don't get this. And the reason I know you don't get this is because how too many of you choose to live. Too many of you live defeated lives. You, leave, you live weak lives. Too many of you live oppressed lives. Too many of you live insignificant lives. Too many of you live complaining lives. See, the reason God gave you these spiritual blessings now is because they're the things you need now to live a God-honoring life, to live a, a, a righteous life, to live a, a, a life that brings honor and glory to God. That's why God gave you these spiritual blessings now. Now, let me unpack this for you. I want you to listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter six, okay? The word of God says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Okay, you see that? I'm talking to you, Christian. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. What God is communicating to all of us is this. You have an enemy, but it's not the person sitting next to you. You got an enemy. He's real. But it's not a, it's not a human being enemy. It's, a, it's, it's not your spouse. It's not your kids. It's not your boss. It's not your neighbor. Now, the spiritual enemy is so good that he can make it seem like your enemy is your spouse. He can make it seem like your enemy is your parents or your boss or some employee or a neighbor or whatever it might be. But God's word says the, the truth is the war that we're in is not against each other. It's a spiritual war. Peter put it this way. He said, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Once again, Peter weighs in and basically says the same thing. You have an enemy, Christian. And it's not your spouse. Maybe the greatest truth that will revolutionize your life as you walk out of here today, recognizing you got an enemy, but it ain't your spouse. It's not your dad. It's not your mother. It's not your parents. Looks like it. Kind of feels like it. But that's not the enemy. The enemy we have is spiritual. Now, I want you to think about this. Here you are in this battle, a spiritual battle. You got an enemy that hates you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your fam family. He wants to make sure you live a weak life. He wants to make sure you live an insignificant life. He wants to make sure that, uh, that you live a fruitless life. He wants to make sure that you don't live out the will of God in your life. 
He doesn't want you to look like Jesus. So when your enemy attacks, what do you need? How do you overcome his attack? How do you overcome your flesh? What do you need to accomplish God's will for your life? What what do you need to live a fruitful life? What do you need to live a God-honoring life? What do you need to live a life that honors Christ? What do you need to live a life that your, your kids would be proud of? What do you need? A bigger house? A new car? A better watch? More money? A new spouse? Beloved, none of these things will help you. They're simply material things. They won't do anything to help you overcome the enemy that you face. They won't do anything to help you overcome your flesh. They won't help you become more like Jesus. None of those things will help you live a fruitful life for God. None of those things will help you become more and more like Christ. Not one of them. Nothing wrong with those things. None of those things will give you the power you need to live a fruitful life for God. So what do you need? You need God's spiritual blessings because nothing else will help you overcome your enemy. Nothing. Nothing else will help you overcome your flesh. God's spiritual blessings are the things that feed your inner man and keep your inner man alive and well and and healthy and strong in your life. It's God's spiritual blessings that we need to accomplish God's will in our lives. You can be the wealthiest person on the earth and yet be helpless against your enemy. You could could have the biggest house in Modesto and still be helpless against your enemy. You could have the best looking spouse in town. You could have the kindest spouse in town and it still wouldn't mean a thing in terms of the fight that you have against your enemy. Why? Because none of them give you the power you need to overcome your enemy. What you need are God's spiritual blessings. Once again, I want you to look at what Peter said in in chapter five. He said, watch out, stay alert. Your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your new house, your new car, your boyfriend, your, your girlfriend, your new job. Jesus said it's the truth that sets you free, Christian. And be strong in your belief in God. Stand firm in your faith. That's what you need, Christian, to overcome the enemy or to overcome your flesh. Now let me quickly give you a few of God's spiritual blessings. I'm just gonna rattle through a few of them. Number one, the blessing of being one of God's children. The Bible says in John chapter one, he, that's Jesus, came into the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him, to all who accepted him, to all who surrendered their life over to him, he gave those people the right to become children of God. How many of you, when you woke up today, thought to yourself, you know what, I'm I'm a child of God. That means if you're a guy, you're a prince. If you're a gal and you know Christ, you're a princess, because he's the king. You ever thought about that? You're, You're a child of God Almighty. I've always thought it was a very uh, special thing that my daughter, Megan, my daughter, Gracie, and my son, Cade, were a part of my family. I've tried to make them feel like, you know, it's a pretty special thing to be a part of the countryman family, not because I'm the pastor of the church, but you're a part of my family. And because they're a part of my family, you know what? I'm committed. Now my family's grown, my oldest daughter got married, now my son-in-law, Brandon, I consider him as part of my family. You're in my family. When you're in my family, wow, 
A lot of bennies that go along with that. I'm gonna love them and care for them like nobody else will. I'm a part of his family. <laughs> You're a part of his family. That's a spiritual blessing to know that you are a part of his family, that you are one of his kids. And probably 99.6% of you have never even thought about that this morning. You never woke up and thought, man, I'm, a, I'm one of God's children. And I want you to know, knowing that truth is critical to overcoming your enemy. Knowing that truth can set you free. There's just that truth alone. If you really dig down into that truth. Number two, the, the blessing of being a new creation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And he's not talking about our flesh. This isn't new, this is old, this is decaying. It's gonna end up in a pine box six, eight feet under the ground. He's talking about the spirit that is within you, is new. Man, I'm, 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 I'm getting close to 60. My body doesn't work like it used to. My friend Jeff and I, you know, he coaches girls softball, I coach the baseball team, and it seems like every year, First couple of weeks of practice, I go home and I'm popping more pills than normal. My knees are all goofed up, my arms goofed up, just throwing a ball, just swinging a bat. I'm not even hitting anything, I'm just starting to swing. My hips are all goofed up. And just, this, this body is wasting away. But what's weird is, man, Jeff, we're alive inside. I got juice inside that's unbelievable because I'm a new creation on the inside. Ephesians chapter two says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he's planned for us long ago. Number three, the blessing of being a citizen of heaven. <laughs> Man, I'm walking around here in Modesto. I'm a citizen of this great country, the United States of America. I couldn't think, I'm so thankful that for whatever reason, this is where I was born. But here's the deal, <laughs> my real citizenship is in glory. Amen. I'm gonna tell you right now, look, look, the, the older I get, the more I look forward to crossing the, the finish line, glorification, this ain't it. That's one of the spiritual blessings that all of us have to keep in mind. You wanna, you wanna defeat the enemy? You wanna defeat your flesh? You gotta, you gotta really grasp the fact that this isn't where you're gonna spend the rest of your life. If that were true, that would be, that, that'd be a bummer. This is it? This is what I got to look forward to? A whole bathroom sink full of pills? Every two years, just went in. I felt like I just had these redone and the doctor said, you know, it's been two years since you had your eyes done. I said, really, two years? I went in, I gotta go get new ones. They're just, my eyes are going bad. But this ain't it. One of the blessings that God has bestowed upon you is you have a citizenship reserved for you already in glory. How about this one, the blessing of, of being forgiven? Wow, I've been forgiven. That's a lot of sin, man. That's a lot of guilt. It's a lot of shame. I got stuff in my life that I'd be embarrassed if you knew about. I'd be really embarrassed, really shamed. I'd be humiliated. And God says, I forgave you. You don't have to walk around in guilt and shame and whatever. I forgave you of your sins. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I've forgiven you. And for some of you, when the Bible says he's forgiven us from the east to the west, it doesn't make any sense to you. If he would have said north to south, we're all in trouble. 
Because if you're at the North Pole and you start heading south and you get to the South Pole, now you know what happens when you start going up north, you're heading north again. In other words, what goes around comes around, right? When you start to go around the globe from the east to the west, you never head the other direction. You're always going east. Always. Meaning, when God says, I have forgiven you as far as the east is from the west, that means it's done, over, done. It's not coming back around again. Human beings may do that. They'll forgive you and then remember and then forgive you and then remember. I don't do that. <laughs> and when you really grasp that, that spiritual blessing, that'll change your life. Number five, the blessing of having God's Holy Spirit inside of you. Wow. I have the greatest power source known to mankind living within me. And so do you, if you know Christ. Listen, Christian, don't ever get on your knees and say, oh God, I need more power. Oh God, I need more. I need something more. I want more. You don't need more. You have everything you need now, Christian. When you ask God for something more, you're simply, you just don't understand what the Bible teaches. And that's okay. But here's a great moment of learning. Here is where the truth can set you free. When you get on your knees and ask God for more, he's got to think to himself, look, I've given it to you already. What do you mean you want more? What else could you want? You have it. Just learn to tap into it. The issue isn't me giving you more. The issue is you have everything you need now. Look, the list goes on and on and on. All this to say that God has blessed us. And these blessings are all that you need to overcome your enemy, to overcome your flesh. They're everything you need to live a God-honoring life, a fruitful life, a life that would you know, reflect well on Jesus, a life that your children would be proud of or your grandkids would be proud of. Look, man, I, when I get to the end, and I don't know how much time I got, but there's gonna come a moment when I'm in a pine box somewhere, and you know what? I, I, I don't care what I leave my kids. Uh, someone may get my watch, and I don't know, maybe somebody will want a shirt, probably not. <laughs> Tommy Bahama will be out, uh, you know. Whatever, it's out now, right? <laughs> That's what some of you are thinking. Um, what are you talking about? It's going out. It's out already, Pastor. Update your wardrobe. Um, I don't care about any of that. I want them to look in that pine box and I want them to go, man, my dad did his best to live a God-honoring life. That's what I want. Don't, 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 don't you want that? Not perfect. I'd hate for them to get a big house and a big car and a bunch of money and yet look in there and go, I'm bummed out he's gone, but no, no integrity, no whatever. And I think that's what all of you want, every one of you. And I don't care what you did last night. What I care about is what you do when you leave here. And you can walk out of here saying, you know what, God, you've given me everything I need. You've given me every spiritual blessing. I'm going to walk out of here, and I want to live a God-honoring life, a fruitful life, a life that my kids, my children, maybe it's your grandkids. I don't know who it's going to be. Maybe it's your great-grandkids. Maybe you've already blown it with your kids. I don't know. But you're going to start now. Say, I want to live a life that my kids are proud of or whatever all that might be. Now, not only has the Father blessed you, but number two, the, the work of the Father is he has loved you. Verse four says, even before he, once again, that's God, made the world, God loved us. He loved us. He blessed you. That's a truth. But another truth is he loved you. John said this in 1 John chapter four. He said, dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love doesn't know God. Why? For God is love. Now, what does that little phrase mean, for God is love? Well, it means that God 
in his very nature loves. That's what it means. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? What does it mean that it's in God's very nature to love? Well, it means that, that God loves not because he finds some object like human beings or you and I worthy of his love. He, he simply loves because it's in his very nature to love. In other words, and I wrote this down for you, God's love has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with how good or bad you are. God simply loves you because of who he is. It's an unconditional kind of love. I don't care what you did last night. When you woke up this morning, God loved you just as much as he did the day before. Now I realize some of you, it's hard for you to grasp that because you had a dad who only, you know, loved you if you took the garbage out, you know, and you mowed the lawn and you only got good grades or whatever all that is. That, you, you grew up in a home where it was a conditional love. But that's not the love that God has for us. He just loves you because. And so when that little green basket went by you a little bit ago, and some of you went, you know what, I'm gonna help the church out, I'm gonna help my church out, I'm gonna give a little bit more. He didn't love you more because you gave. And if that basket went by you and you thought, I ain't giving anything to church, man, I gotta go buy a new pair of shoes. And it went by, he, he loves you. He didn't love you less. And it's that kind of love, that agape love, that unconditional love, that's what motivates us to want to love him back, is that he just loves us. And let me tell you something, when you understand that truth, that he loves you, he just loves you. Man, I want you to know, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I didn't get it. And so much of my day, much of my week, much of my month was, I was like the hamster on the treadmill. I was always trying to make him love me. And, you know, I'd be doing well, you know, okay. And then I'd do something stupid, you know, I'd sin or whatever. And then I thought, oh man, he didn't love me anymore. And so I just, I, I gotta go do some things. I gotta, I gotta make sure he loves me. Last thing I want is the big guy mad at me, right? And so, man, I was always working and working and working and working to make sure that he loved me. But Jesus was right. The truth will set you free. And as I began to grow in my faith in the Lord and I began to see things in Ephesians chapter one like we're looking in right now, and I began to learn that truth, it began to revolutionize my life. I could get off of the treadmill the confidence to know that he loves me no matter what. And man, if he was gonna love me like that, wow, I, I wanted to love him back. Not because he was just, you know, okay, countryman, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Oh, you blew it! Bam! And that's the way some of you, I think, that's your view of, the, of your father in heaven because maybe that's how your father here on earth was. And Jesus is right. The truth will set you free. Revolutionize your life when you understand the, 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 the love of God. Look, God loved you even when you were a sinner. God loved you when you went, wanted nothing to do with him. God loved you when you didn't even believe in him. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, he went to a cross. He didn't go to that cross because we were all a bunch of good people, righteous people, holy people, walking with God. No, no, no. He went to that cross when we were but sinners. It demonstrates just how incredible his love is for us. In a few weeks, we'll be at Ephesians chapter 3, and this was another prayer that Paul had. He says, hey, I pray that you and all of God's holy people will have the power to understand the greatness of Christ's love, how wide his love is, how long his love is, how high his love is, how deep his love is. Christ's love is greater than anyone can ever know. <laughs> and it's that last sentence. Paul says, man, I'm praying. I'm praying that you guys will really understand this love that God has for you. But the bottom line is, it's, it's greater than you could ever figure out. Give it a shot. Try to figure it out. Try to understand it. But here's the bottom line. 
The fact that God Almighty would leave the glories of heaven and come to planet Earth and live a perfect life and voluntarily go to a cross so that your sins could be forgiven, that you could spend your eternity with him. But that's just crazy. It's crazy. Number three, the, the third work of the Father is this, is he's chosen you. Verse four says, even before he, that's God, made the world, he, he loved us and he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God, God chose you. He chose you. I want you. I want you. I'll take you. I want you to be in my family, and I want you to be in my family. Hey, I want you in my family. And then he began to do a work. He began to draw you to himself. He may have used your grandma, your grandpa. He may have used a neighbor, Billy Graham. He may have used a Christmas musical. I don't know what he used, but God said, I want that guy. I want that gal. I want you to be a part of my family. He chose you. He's the one who chose you. Well, pastor, uh, I thought I chose him. No, you didn't. Now, we kind of have to word it in a way that makes it sound like you chose him. But the bottom line is, you had nothing to do with it. Your sin wouldn't allow you to choose him. In fact, let me write this down. I'm gonna tell you how this works. Your role in salvation is this. Listen, you do all the sinning, and God's role in salvation is he does all the saving. Okay, that, 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 that's how it works. In fact, Jesus himself said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. And obviously in, that, in its context, context <clears throat> he's talking to his disciples, but it's also true about us. He chose you. He chose you. Do you get it? He chose you. Well, Rick, do you believe in a, a free will? I do. At least as it relates to salvation. I think the Bible's crystal clear that anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, how does that work? If God does all the choosing, and yet we have a free will, how does that work? Well, here's the deal. God, God begins to work. He, he gets you to this point, and I think that there's this moment at least as it relates to your salvation, where you can say, I want you, God. Or you say, I don't, want, I don't want you. I know immediately some of you are going, well, how do those two doctrines work? I don't know. Maybe this is one of those Isaiah 55 things where God says, hey, hey, I want you to understand something. Your thoughts aren't my thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and yours and my ways and yours. In other words, I, you're not me. And there may be some things that you can't figure out. There may be some things that don't make any sense in your mind. How in the world can those two things go together? I don't know. They don't go together in my mind. In fact, there are denominations that have started because we're in this camp. And then there's, these, no, we're in this camp because everybody's got to have everything kind of all worked out. I don't. I just know God does all the choosing. Uh, but I also know anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't make any sense in my mind, but it does in his. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. I don't believe in God. Are you trying to tell me God didn't choose me? Yeah, apparently not. <laughs> well, well, what if I want to give my life to Christ? Well, you want to give your life to Christ? You can come forward. I'll lead you in a prayer, and you can give your life to Christ. And then guess what we found out? <laughs> he chose you. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't know how else to do it. I'm not trying to be weird. Uh, uh, that's, all I can, uh, that's all I can figure out in my little brain, I'm trying to keep these deep theological things down at a plane where we can all get them and under, understand them. But the bottom line is you can't miss what God's Word says. He chose you. Wow. Think that through. Think that through for a second. Hey, look, I, I got three children. And when they all came out of the Hatcherewski, that's what I got. <laughs> okay. 
There have been a few times I wanted to go, can I take it back? <laughs> is, there, is there a refund process? I, go, I, I got what I got. Guess what God did? He knew you. And he said, man, I'm going to take you. Me? Yeah, I'll take you too. Come on. He knew. He knew everything about you. He knew the good. He knew the bad. He knew the ugly. Hey, Peter, I want you. And he knew Peter was going to deny him three times. I want you, Peter. Come on. God knows everything about us, and yet he made a choice to take us on to make us a part of his family. Which brings me to the last one, and that is he adopted you. Look at verse uh, five. So God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. He chose you and he adopted you. L listen to how Romans puts it in Romans chapter eight. He says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Beloved, here's the deal. When you received Christ as your Savior, not only were your sins forgiven, not only was your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or whatever, but he established, God established a, a brand new relationship with you, one in which you don't have to fear his wrath anymore, one in which you don't have to fear death anymore. This is a brand new relationship built on sonship, if you will. I want you to look at that phrase in Romans 8 that says, now we call him Abba Father. That word Abba is an informal Aramaic uh, term that simply means father or daddy or papa, and it carries with it a sense of tenderness or, or intimacy. Beloved, it's, a, it's the most intimate term that you can use, and it's the way that God wants you to relate to him. Now let me just say this, because I, I think we have a generation that has swung the pendulum so far the other direction, I need to say this. God wants you to go to him, he's your father. He wants you to call him dad, daddy, papa. He's your father, okay? That, that, that's an intimate term. But God's not your buddy. Because God wants to have an intimate relationship with you, like you're a part of his family, that doesn't mean you can take that to the extreme where you and God are just, you know, buddies. And then he's okay with anything you do. My children, um, I'm, not, I'm not their buddy. I'm not their best friend. And if I become their buddy, or they ever call me their best friend, I want you to know I fumble as a parent. I'm not their buddy, and I'm not their best friend. I'm their dad. I'm their father. And the term father or dad or mother or mom carries with it a weight. There's something sticky about that. I'll even use the term, I want my children to have a fear of me. Not because I'm gonna punch them in the face or you know, burn them with a cigarette, but I want them to have a reverential fear of their dad. That's what, in the Bible, when it says the fear of the Lord, it's not talking about, ee, we cower behind a bush or something because we're afraid he's gonna punch us. It's a reverential fear. Woo, man, he, you know, he's damned. Now listen, I can have all kinds of fun with my kids and we can laugh and goof off and tease each other and all that, but here's the deal, I'm their dad. And they know that, and they know Aaron's mom. And they don't mess with that. I mean, I'll tell you, we can laugh and we can have fun and, and, and we can tickle and all those things, well, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> They're a little older, that'd be weird. That'd be, I'd, I'd, be a, I'd be a weird dad. I can't, can't do that anymore. Just, you know, whatever. Can we edit that out? That one, that's not going to sound good on the, on the radio. <laughs> Get out of that church in a hurry. Um, point is, is you can have fun with your kids, but there, there's a, there, you, you want them, there's a buffer. There's a buffer. 
And, and when God says, hey, call me dad. Come to me like I'm your dad. Call me papa. Man, that is a beautiful thing. It's a great invitation to come to a, a dad who cares about you deeply. But, but don't, don't carry the illustration too far. Okay, he's still the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's still the Alpha and Omega. He's still the one who just thought, I don't know, and there was a porcupine. Okay, but what a beautiful image that we get to call him Abba, Father. So, so here's what I want to do. Everybody stand up. Here, here, here. I'm going to ask Pastor Bobby to come up. He's going to close us in prayer. But I, <coughs> I want to say <coughs> these four things out loud together. Okay, I want us to say them. Here, here we go. Number one, the Father blessed me. The Father chose me. The Father loved me. And the Father adopted me. Now look, I want you to know something. Just those four truths, pretty powerful. And Jesus is right. The truth will set you free if you really understand them. But, but let me give you an ending thought. Why did the Father bless you? Why did he love you? Why did he choose you? Why did he adopt you? Well, the end of verse 5 says this. This is what the father wanted to do and it gave him pleasure. That's why I did it. Hey, hey, I wanna, I wanna, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bless you and I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna choose you and I'm gonna adopt you. And he, it gave him pleasure. You, Christian, gave him pleasure. You, he did it because it brought great pleasure to God. That's why he did it. It made him happy. It made him happy to bless you. It made him happy to love you. It brought him joy to, to choose you. Adopt you. Just a, just crazy to think about. You did that. You. And somehow, some way, may these truths matter to you uh, this week. Pastor Bobby, we come and pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, as we close, just pray we leave this place with great, great joy. Joy knowing we were chosen. And Father, would that joy go with us throughout the week and would that joy overflow in us? And cause us to share with others that don't know you about the joy that we have. So, Father, we thank you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.